you may, want, you may be asking yourself, will this be on the test? This, this will not be on the test, and there is no quiz at the end of today's presentation. Though it did cross my mind that it would be sort of fun to do a poll quiz to see how much information was new. Now, I would like to introduce to you our moderator. <coughs> And it is truly a privilege to have him with us today. Juan Williams is one of America's leading journalists. He appears regularly on National Public Radio and is a contributing political analyst for the Fox News Channel and a regular panelist on Fox News Sunday. He's also appeared on Nightline, Washington Week in Review, Oprah, CNN's Crossfire, where he frequently served as a co-host, and the Capitol Gang Sunday. He is the author of the critically acclaimed biography, Thurgood Marshall, American Revolutionary, as well as the non-fiction bestseller, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, 1954 to 1965, the companion volume to the critically acclaimed television series. He's also written books about African American religious experience and civil rights movement. During his 21 career at the Washington Post, Williams served as an editorial writer, op-ed columnist, and White House reporter. He has won an Emmy Award for TV documentary writing, and his articles have appeared in Newsweek, Fortune, The Atlantic Monthly, Ebony, and others. So please help me welcome digital writer Juan Williams. Good morning. Thank you so much, Sharon. You're saying all those nice things about me. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> so, this is great to be here. Uh, it's a real honor be part of this morning's briefing. Uh, I look forward to the presentations by the teachers, which will be followed by a panel discussion. As you know, technology is key to improving education. And we can think of that in terms of student performance, student outcomes. We can also think of it in terms of enhancing both the information that teachers have on students and what teachers are able to do with their students. So we're going to have time for each of the teachers this morning to explain how they use technology, but also for questions from you, so that as you have this experience this morning with the teachers, you can get more out of it in terms of specific inquiries or ideas that you may want to present to the teachers. The three teachers on today's panel, as Sharon was saying, are visionaries. They figured out before many of their colleagues and certainly before many of us, the technology in the classroom can enhance learning, engage students, and better prepare them for the world in which they're going to live. These teachers are indeed at the center of innovation and revolution in the classroom. Personally, I get it. I understand that technology is changing everything. I'm a journalist, Sharon told you. So in my profession, it's just been transformative in terms of the impact of technology. If you think about it, uh, in my lifetime as a journalist, we've gone from you know, morning papers and afternoon papers, which no longer exist, and then, of course, to the birth of the internet, to cable. Gosh, you now have tweeting, blogging, websites. It's just been an explosion in terms of opportunity and ways in which people gain access to news. So it's just constant update. And, of course, that means that readers have more choices for news, they have a bigger appetite for news, but it also comes with shorter attention spans and demand for more multimedia presentation. The written word, of course, fits into this, but the written word just by itself now uh, requires some enhancement in terms of that technology as a platform. Maybe the real lesson here is that America's schools are now catching up. In the digital world of the 21st century, everybody needs to know how to write using digital tools. Moreover, with ready access to the internet, young people today really never stop learning. It enhances their ability to write because their ability to get information that supports good writing is there and available through the internet. Our schools, as a result, have to do a better job of linking what goes on inside the classroom with learning, information gathering, and the communication that takes place after school. The questions before our three teachers, the panelists today, will be, how are we using technology today? Is it working? And what can we do to expedite changes in America's classrooms? 
I'll now introduce the teachers on today's panel. They are, in their own way, as I said, at the cutting edge of a revolution taking place in America's classrooms and schools. The first presenter will be Robert Rivera Amazola. He's a fourth grade teacher at Francis Willard Elementary School in Philadelphia. Through his affiliation with the Philadelphia Writing Project, Mr. Rivera has led local and national workshops for teachers on the use of digital technology. He also serves on the leadership team of the National Writing Project's English Language Learners Network. Next will be Joe Malley. He's a high school language arts teacher at Chicatawa Central High School in Buffalo, outside of Buffalo. Joel also writes a blog, Buried in Wires, that explores teaching, how, how to teach writing in the digital era. He was recently featured on Teachers Teaching Teachers, a weekly webcast of the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. Mr. Malley is the tech liaison for Western New York Writing Project. Our last teacher will be Jennifer Wolven, a high school language arts teacher at Eastside Memorial Green Tech High School in Austin, Texas. This is the second year at Green Tech, a science, math, engineering, and technology school for Ms. Wolven. Uh, she's a teacher consultant with the Central Texas Writing Project at Texas State University. So we're going to begin with Robert Rivera Amazola. In addition to being a fourth grade teacher, uh, you should know that he loves to travel and scuba dive, so in terms of writing, gives him lots of opportunities for journals, so please welcome Robert. Robert Rivera Mazzola, and I have taught fourth grade for the last nine years at the Willard Elementary Public School in Philadelphia to students who are largely English language learners. This year I became the technology teacher and coordinator for the school, so my job has changed just a little bit. I love what I do, and just so that you know, at our school, as with most of the teachers, we work very hard to meet our standardized test objectives. My work with technology helps to break this test prep monotony. And in case you're wondering, it will be work very hard to meet these goals. And for the third year in a row, we have made our AYP numbers. I want to describe briefly how I've used technology to engage my students and support their learning. For the last two years, my class has conducted a year-long service learning project. In addition to the obvious benefits that service learning has for the classroom, um, my experience has been that kids really build a strong sense of community and relationship when they are engaged in work that allows them to see how their work helps others. I use many methods to create classroom community each year, but service learning is a wonderful way to incorporate service work with community building. I also thought it made sense to invest my English language learners in a project that offered cross-curricular opportunities. At the beginning of the year, I did not know how all of the ways technology would be able to fit into our project. So my students like to talk a lot, uh, and they like to talk about goals and projects. So as you can imagine, with 30 children in the room, I had a lot of opinions have to organize and be creative about eventually narrowing down to one thought. So this is when we began to use various digital and web tool tools. So you might think of some of these tools as used primarily by adults, but it turned out to be um, a great way to use with kids. And it, in particular, blogs were a great way to be able to thrash out ideas and to come with, out with one particular idea. We eventually used Doodle.com, an online polling site, to vote on the issue that was most important. And pollution emerged as a topic they really wanted to focus on this particular school year. So for the next stage of the class project, it was time for the group to narrow down their topic even further. So we read articles and had class discussions, but because I had so many English language learners in the room, it was important for me to make the information accessible to them. So 
So once again, technology came to the rescue. We used online resources to further the research process. Between online videos for students with limited English proficiency and more text-based resources for students with better reading proficiency, students gathered in groups to work in PowerPoints and make presentations to share with the class. They would then eventually make um, a case for a specific facet of pollution that they explored together. Eventually, the favorite emerged, and it was water pollution and contamination. So around springtime that year, as part of this project, we took a class trip to the Fairmount Waterworks in Philadelphia. This is a site of a 19th century municipal water supply, and now a center for our understanding of the Philadelphia urban watershed and its history. A staff member there of the Fairmount Waterworks Interpretive Center also came to my classroom and engaged the class further on the issues of water pollution. Pulling all of this learning together, the students gave presentations to other classrooms. They made brochures for distribution and booklets outlining the facts that they uncovered about water pollution and conservation. So the students by this time got really excited and they wanted to be able to share what they had learned with a wider audience. So it was at this time that I suggested that they use and record podcasts to upload to the School District of Philadelphia's <coughs> podcast website. Now podcasting had proven very useful to the students in other curricular areas in the past. They were familiar with the technology. It's a great way to show what they know and to have a lot of fun doing it. The kids wrote their own scripts, they revised them, interviewed pertinent individuals, and rewrote them before actually recording and then submitting the podcasts to the website. The podcasts were so successful that the Fairmont Waterworks uploaded them for a brief period of time onto their website. My students were not the only ones to learn a great deal that year. I did too. Instead of making technology fit into our service learning project, my job, I discovered, was to determine what our objectives were with the class, and if a particular piece of technology fit into these objectives, then we used it. Technology ultimately made wiser and more efficient use of our class time. More importantly, my students had a lot of fun doing it. So what you're going to see now is sort of a visual mosaic of images of my classroom overlaid by the voices of some of my students in their first podcast. I want to highlight Elaine, who was the first voice you'll hear. Now she was um, an advanced English language learner, and you'll be able to tell by the way she narrates the podcast. But the subsequent students that you're going to hear were not quite as advanced, including a little girl who had just arrived from Puerto Rico just a few months before we started the podcasting. Her writing and general English acquisition, her confidence blossomed during this contribution of the podcast. So you're going to hear the voices of her voice, her particular voice, when you see the student drawings. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, this is Elaine, and I'll be your host for today's podcast. Today's topic is Thanks, Ivan and Emily. Now, so tell us more about what we use. 
use surface and groundwater for. Here are Ray, Lewis, and Evelyn. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hey. You guys know what a gun of man looks like, right? Right. Well, most American that you and I use it and every of 1,500 days of water every day. Wow! A person can use as much as 50 gallons of water taking a bath and if you leave the water running while you are brushing your teeth, you can waste about 10 gallons of water down the drain. <coughs> Our next speaker is Joe Malley, and as I told you, Joe comes from Chikatawa Central High School outside of Buffalo. You should know he's the father of a five-year-old and he's, who's just started kindergarten, and that Joe writes a parenting blog. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Williams, and um, thank you all for coming. Um, just a little bit of history. I've been teaching for 10 years, and I've been really fortunate in my 10 years of teaching. Very early on, I became involved with two organizations that have really helped my teaching and provided me with the foundation that has uh, kind of run consistently throughout my classroom for the last 10 years. In 2002, I became involved with City Voices, City Visions, which is a partnership with the University of Buffalo teaching teachers how to teach students how to write with digital video. Um, we always like to brag that we were making, our kids were making films three years before YouTube existed. Um, in 2003, I was accepted into the Western New York Writing Project Summer Institute, and that month-long experience provided me with the foundation, um, those writing pedagogies that have also provided the foundation for my classroom, so I've been very fortunate. Um, a little more history, I started teaching in 2001 in the Buffalo Public School District. Um, great kids, great teachers, great building. But as my career progressed, I, there were some things I was uncomfortable with. We started moving toward, more towards scripted instruction. We started moving more towards a one-size-fits-all philosophy. Um, for instance, every kid on, let's say, November 1st across the entire city was supposed to be on Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth, um, despite the fact that the kid in the front row was on a 5th grade reading level and the kid in the back row was on an 11th grade reading level. And, um, I knew that education could be better, and I knew that my students deserved more. So after seven years, I actually left a tenured position with the Buffalo Public School District to um, seek another setting for teaching. So I landed at Chittawaga Central, and um, Chittawaga Central is a very uh, wide economic diversity. 41% um, of our kids are in the free and reduced lunch program. And uh, on the other edge of town, there are $300,000 McMansions, and all these kids come together in this place to kind of learn together. It's, it's a wonderful place to teach and an innovative place to teach. We have forward-thinking administrators. And it's a really supportive environment to teach in. Um, we also boast five Western New York Writing Project English teacher, teacher consultants on our staff. And um, last year, we had an 88% um, passing rate in the ELA region, so we also were able to tie that together. I teach three different classes of very, three very different goals. I teach AP Literature and Composition, which is probably my most traditional class. I also teach English 10, and a wonderful class called Mass Media and Film Production. Um, I could... I could... Uh, I like to refer to my, my class as a digital writing workshop. And, uh, I could explain it to you, but I think it's going to be a little bit better than job. So. Even though my class has gone digital, writing still forms the foundation of all the things we do. Suits may record podcasts and create documentaries and write blogs, but storytelling is the basis for everything. Regardless if my students are in AP Literature, English 10, or Mass Media and Film Production, the first step of every project is to write extensively. 
Students blog on a social network I've created solely for our class. Students write to plan their project. They write to reflect on progress. They write to delve deeper into their topics. My students' writing is open and public. Students read each other's work and offer suggestions and feedback in the comments. This is one of the ways that we grow. As projects gain momentum, we move beyond traditional writing and start composing in multiple modes. Students storyboard, gather footage, import, organize, edit, and reshoot on their way to fulfilling their vision. The class is workshop-based, so in class, students work. Although there are demonstrations interspersed and introduce new writing and cinematic <laughs> techniques, most instruction is delivered at the point of need. In this stage of the process, students continue to write reflective blogs, revise their narration, and receive feedback from their peers and myself through comments and collaborative writing tools like Google Docs. Students reach a state of flow as their brains process an endless stream of decisions about shots, sequencing, titles, music, tonality, transitions, balance, and many other digital storytelling tools at their disposal. This immersion in the content produces deep learning. Finally, at the conclusion of each project, student films are screened. During screenings, peers analyze and discuss the many different choices each filmmaker made. Throughout the course of the year, students make films in many different genres. They turn classic poems into films. Season of mist, with mellow fruitfulness. Close bosom friend, of maturing sun. Create personal narratives. For me, it wasn't a heat or freedom or no homework. It was the summer I fell in love. In love with the game. And ultimately make research-based documentary films investigating an issue of their choice. We conducted a survey to see how many teens engaged in any distractions from the web. 79% admit to frequently changing the radio. 64% made to eat. Beyond our project screenings, finished products are watched and shared long beyond the due date. Films are shared via Facebook, and our social network receives traffic from friends, classmates, and family members. Digital writing is different than traditional school writing. These tools make the writing more collaborative, because it more purpose. The writing as an audience writing matters. But most importantly, over the course of the year, there's significant growth in both traditional and digital storytelling skills. Okay. So the question is, you know, why does digital writing matter? How is it different than the writing we've traditionally always done in the classroom? And uh, sort of speak to that, one of the reasons why digital writing matters and why digital writing, um, I think, produces better results for my students is because of, is because of just pure engagement. Uh, my students change over the course of the year. At first, they're very tentative. I tell them about the writing-intensive nature of all of my courses, and some leave, and, but most stay because they know I also give them a taste of, of what we're going to be doing. And um, over the course of the year, around December, I'll start to see my kids popping up in my classroom more and more frequently. They'll be eating breakfast in my room. They'll be in my room during their free periods. They'll, um, they'll spend their lunch time in my room, and often they're after school. These are seniors, most of them. We should have one. You know, they should have one foot out the door. Yet they're in my classroom working on their films. Um, and they start to see themselves as filmmakers, as storytellers, and I think what's most important is thinkers. Um, and the question is why? why? Why are these kids, these seniors in my class all this time? Why do they work so hard on telling these stories? And uh, to answer this, I'm going to have to refer to Daniel Pink. Um, I read Drive last summer, and I think he articulates it really nicely. Um, but he says that the students and workers, they need a couple of factors in result, that intrinsic motivation that lasts long and produces long lasting results. He says we need autonomy, we need mastery. We need purpose. Um, kids need a choice. 
of the topics they're going to choose, the topics they're going to develop. Kids need to um, believe that they're going to get good at something that really matters, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, my students get autonomy within parameter, parameters. I tell them what genre they're going to compose in, but they choose the topic. When you give them choice, they make good choices. I have kids making films about people who have inspired them, kids making films about the loss of loved ones and how that's affected them. I have kids making film investigating racism in our school. I have kids making films about the economic factors that are affecting our city. Um, they tell stories that matter. They write their world kind of like one frame at a time. They, they're writing their existence. Another reason why digital writing matters is that there's an audience, a real audience. Traditional writing in school has no audience other than the teacher. The kid hands in a paper, I read it, that's the end of that. Digital tools allow us to extend those boundaries, and I think it really provides it, it makes a difference. Um, and I know that it makes a difference, and I see evidence of that. Every Sunday night, I log on to my social networks that I've created on my, for my students, and I see my AP students discussing Wordsworth and Keats um, in our little chat room on our social network. My AP students know that when they come in Monday morning, they will see snippets of their blog posts and I'm going to use to delve deeper into the topics we talked about. My mass media kids know that their peers are going to read every word that they wrote. And they also know that every digital product that they make is going to be screened, it's going to be shared. It just doesn't die on the desk. It's writing for publication. And why I think that matters is because the kids believe that there's an audience. They believe that their words are going to be listened to and heard and read. Um, they start to pay attention to things like revision. They start to pay attention to things like originality. They write like writers. And it's really awesome to see. I think, um, I think digital writing matters for one more reason, and that's design. And I'm going to have to read just a direct quote, quote from Daniel Pink, but this time a whole new mind. I read other books too. But um, <laughs> Daniel Pink and a whole new mind argues that the future belongs to a very different kind of person with a very different kind of mind. Um, creators, empathizers, pattern recognizers, and meaning makers. He says that these people, artists, inventors, designers, storytellers, caregivers, consolers, big picture thinkers, will now reap society's richest rewards and share its greatest joys. You all know that writing is hard work. We've all written papers. But I'm going to argue that digital writing is more difficult. Digital writing has many layers, it's complex. Kids have to decide not only on the written word, they have to decide about font, they have to decide about um, music that kind of goes along with it. They have to make all these decisions. Um, and I think when they do, they've transcended writing, they've moved on towards designing experience. And I think that, um, I think that that's very important. Um, because if you believe Daniel Pink, and if you believe Tom Friedman, if you believe Richard Florida, that uh, communication, collaboration, and design is super important in the 21st century workplace. It's going to be super important in our 21st century cities. It's going to be extremely important in our 21st century economy. And um, I'd like to make the argument that we need to make it extremely important in our 21st century classroom. Thank you very much. Before you go, what was that football? Um, I've taken it from Lord of the Flies in order to make sure that the conversations are organized and people don't talk over each other. We use a cop and we pass around the football in order to. You can speak if you have the football, essentially. Well, that's high tech. Okay, so our final speaker is Jennifer Wolven, as I told you. She's a high school language arts teacher at Eastside Memorial Green Tech High School in Austin, Texas. She has a seven-year-old son in the second grade and began her teaching career as an English teacher in South Korea. So please welcome Jennifer Wool. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here and to be able to share with you the work that is happening in my classroom. Um, I am currently in my 11th year of teaching. Ten of those 11 years have been at low socioeconomic, um, struggling schools. Um, the past two years I have been at Eastside Memorial Green Tech, a school that has had to um, be repurposed due to um, its, its struggling nature and trying to keep up with um, performance standards over the last seven years. Um, last
last year, in our first year, we were able to make some very significant gains on our standardized tests. Um, and so we're definitely looking forward to um, the future. Um, there, and there are a lot of exciting things that are going on um, at Green Tech. Um, the focus of our school is a STEM school at Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, we're also part of a larger network um, of over 60 new tech schools that span 14 different states across the country. And the, 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 the uh, kind of common denominator is that we're all project-based learning schools. Um, and the other thing is, is digital tools. Digital tools are an integral component of all green tech classrooms. Um, and I want to highlight how those have kind of benefited um, my students. So I feel like I've been able to see some very meaningful and effective technology integration um, and the use of digital tools in my classroom positively impact um, student engagement, collaboration, uh, communication, critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving, all of which are skills that are valued and promoted at Green Tech. Um, I want to share with you a few student stories that really in, in illustrate the empowerment um, and increased student learning uh, that occurs when students are able to use these digital tools in the classroom. So the first student that I would like to introduce you to is Maria. Um, Maria is a ninth grade English language learner. Um, she is a very social and creative student uh, who loves to read, she loves writing, she loves decorating her MySpace page. Um, during class discussion, she comes alive. Her contributions are very insightful um, and original. Um, but at first, she had some difficulty staying focused um, in the classroom and was very easily distracted um, by her online social network that um, were possible because of our school's one-to-one -one computer to student ratio. Um, during a project in which students were analyzing energy use and pollution data for our community and then making comparisons to other parts of the world, we use a digital tool called Glogster. Uh, this tool allows students to create um, online posters, and unlike the traditional classroom poster board, this digital tool allows students to add images, text, animation, audio, and video, um, and then customize their backgrounds. Um, students can then share their final product um, online and publish it. Um, this platform was something that really captured Maria's desire for a more sophisticated outlet for her own creativity. Um, she had to select images and sounds um, that, would, um, th that would be able to get across her team's message. Um, the writing pieces had to be concise and yet powerful. Um, I want to share with you a few words from Maria about using this tool, your peers. So in order to help um, team help keep teamwork um, organized and transparent in my classroom, I have begun to require teams to set up Google Groups, Google Sites, Google Documents, or sometimes wikis, just depending on the project to manage their work. Um, and this tool, this, this tool has uh, really empowered student, students such as Julian to check in more easily with their team members, to ask questions about how research on a project is going. Um, it's led to improved writing as students are able to provide each other with more frequent feedback. Um, and ask for clarification when they don't understand the conclusions reached by their team members. Um, after working through several projects in which we use, we've used these tools, um, I have seen a trend developing um, that the students take greater care in their work. They, um, they're thinking more critically, they're generating ideas, and their attention to details of writing um, are there. Okay, let's move on to Darion. So Darion is that student who is always asking, why are we doing this? She wants to know what is the relevancy um, to her education, and she also wants to know um, how this is going to help her community, which she cares very deeply about. Um, she is involved in our school's recycling program. She is also in her second year of an internship with, a, with Urban Roots, a local organization that grows food for the community and promotes sustainable agriculture and healthy eating. To stay engaged, Darion needs to be able to make connections and move outside of the classroom, whether that is through the door or through cyberspace. Um, projects that give her an opportunity to reach broader audience and share her opinions are projects that spark her motivation. 
Uh, we have a, a classroom blog um, that provides student audience, or that provides the audience for student voice that Darion is looking for. Um, we provide, we maintain this online format throughout the year. Students are able to um, share opinions about issues in our school, in our community, in our world. Students write original pieces, link to and comment on articles found on other blogs and news sites, post finished projects, share reflections about our service learning initiatives, post pictures or videos. Uh, and comment on each other's posts. I have found that using social media sites provides an av avenue for student voice and encourages students to think more deeply about their message and intended audience, um, and thus improving their, their writing. Okay. And last, I would like to introduce you to Rex, whom I actually taught two years ago um, at, an Aikens, at Aikens New Tech High School, still in Austin. Um, Rex is a student who is very turned off by writing. He thought poetry was a total waste of his time. Um, but when he was introduced to the concept of creating a digital poem, um, he became very interested. Um, digital poetry allowed him to draw on his talents and his strengths with video editing and working with Flash software. Um, he was able to create a di very dynamic project um, that he truly cared about. Um, and this poetry assignment that may have been very dull and boring for him um, became worthy of his time and his effort. He worked hard to edit the lines of his poem and match up the images with the words um, to, and then to add on his signature flair of the flash animation. The pro this project reflects the complex decision making and creativity that students have to engage in when working in multimedia formats. And now I'll show you what this Racism. Why won't people just let it go? Racism should have stopped 40 years ago. Actually, it should have ended in 1895. But people still have problems with other races being alive. Some say the civil rights movement never ended. But when people say the N-word, we do get offended. So when I walk down the street with nice shoes on my feet, I cross the path of a white family and their child. They stare at me as if I'm about to go wild. Why must I be stereotyped as a thug? When other races see me, why must I be loved? You give me such an ugly stare. This is so unfair. Being judged by the color of my skin. Why won't people just look within? Why must I only be seen as a color? Because in God's eyes, everyone is my sister and my brother. I could go on and on talking about my students and what I have learned from them, about teaching, about learning in the digital age, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're here with our next uh, session. We're here, we're going to have all three teachers join us. Uh, Jennifer Wilbin again from the High School of Language Arts and East Side Memorial Room Tech High School. Uh, Joe Malley from Chief Tuaga Central High School outside of Buffalo, and Robert Rivera and Azola from Francis Willard Elementary School in Philadelphia. Again, we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions in a few moments, and so. I encourage you to think about what you'd like to ask. We're going to have uh, Genevieve and Fiona with microphones in the audience after we go through our little discussion uh, and feed off of the energy and ideas that these teachers saw in each other's presentations. But first, let me, acting as a moderator, ask about something that I saw as a pattern in all three presentations, which was an expansion of the audience for the work of the young people. It seems as if that is key when we're thinking about using digital tools, technology, uh, for teaching. And so I wanted to start by asking you, Jennifer, is my perception right? Is it the idea that you expand the audience critical to then encouraging young people who are interested in writing and in these presentations? Absolutely. I think that... Yeah, let's use the microphone. I think that, that you're right to see what that is. That is a pattern. I think that it gives relevancy to the students. Um, it, it encourages them to, as Joel said, to look more closely at revision um, and to consider their message. Um, so yes, I think that that's key. 
Well, one of the interesting things for me, though, is when we talk about expanding the audience, Joel, is that I look at, from, on the outside, learning about what all three of you do as teaching professionals, and I think, well, gosh, so what does it mean to expand that audience that Jennifer was talking about? You're thinking, in my terms, I'm thinking about people participating, other students participating, as well as the teacher in educating any one student. And then that means engagement, student engagement with each other, collaboration on projects with each other. Joel, is that right? You know what? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you look at I mean, what's going on in media right now in technology, it's the proliferation of communication. People have stories that they want to tell to the basic human need. And we give these students opportunities to tell stories and give these students opportunities to comment on those stories that students are telling, and you get a teacher in the mix to add guidance and push students to think a little bit more deeply. I mean, that's the equation. That's how we get these kids ready for this, this world that they're going to live in. Um, where they must be able to communicate, and they must be critical thinkers. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty accurate. But Jennifer and Joe, before I go on to Robert, let me just say, as someone who is a writer, I was struck by the idea, what's the difference between what they're doing uh, and teaching someone film or video? What if I was to be critical and say, well, are you really teaching writing or are you teaching new platforms for storytelling? Well, I think, I think that we, we have to kind of embrace that um, there are new forms of literacy and we, we have to move forward and, and yes, that the, there that when you're, when you're creating something in a digital format, there's a great deal of writing that goes into that. Um, so I think, I think it's just kind of moving forward and looking at things um, as, they're, as they're changing. Joe? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm certainly not an accomplished writer. As you mentioned, I, I blog. I have my I have a blog where I talk about my family and my blog where I talk about my teaching. So I value writing. And writing is the foundation of everything we do in the classroom. Um, if you are making a film, the film has to have voiceover. Um, so that's that writing piece. My students write reflectively um, on the blog to both plan their, their projects and also to think about their projects and to think about their topics. So the feedback I give them in those spaces and the feedback and they're kind of like the, their anticipation of the audience and how they react, I think, does help teach that teaching. And I also haven't abandoned all the other things that I do to teach teaching, like providing feedback at the point of view. Um, using Google Docs to give them immediate feedback on uh, either things that are doing really well or areas that I need to see their improvement. So. Robert, what I noticed also from watching the three presentations was that uh, in the case, in Jennifer's case and in your case, you're using this also with students who are learning English. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, is this an innovation for the classroom that accelerates the student's ability to pick up a new language? I have found that it has. I frequently like to call podcasting as public speaking, but without being in front of an audience like this, which can be very intimidating even for somebody like me, a 42-year-old male. Um, just imagine a small child just learning English, and I still have colleagues who will kind of make it mandatory for children to provide um, a time for them to make a public presentation. Uh, ever since I had little Michael, long nine little Michael, come up to the front of the class and he was shaking. I mean, I just was saying, right, because he was shaking, paper, I vowed never to do that again. Unless the child volunteered to do that. Podcasting allows the voice, the full flavor of the child to come out without that intimidating space to have to deal with. And the learning, the acquisition of language comes with that as well. Jennifer, uh, do you find that, in fact, the kids write English more quickly with the use of technology in the classroom? I think so. I think that um, all of having having to um, look at things in so many different um, formats um, is helping English language learners. Um, in, in our particular setting where we are um, very much about project-based learning and students have to communicate with their teams um, and they are working on digital formats, they are working on writing, um, it, it seems to kind of propel them um, to a point of, of, of having to um, really communicate better um, and becoming more comfortable and relying on their team members um, to help them out. Um, there is there, there were several uh, ESL students that um, I taught at Aikens High School as seniors, and I, I honestly could not 
tell that they had been ESL um, students, um, and they had been in this program for three years, um, and worked with many digital tools, worked in teams and collaboratively, um, and they're one of the, the teachers that was with them the whole way um, told the story of when they first came into the program, they were very nervous. They, they begged to be out of the program because um, it was just too intense. Um, but by the end, um, their, their progress was so amazing. So let me ask Robert. Robert, when these young people come to your classroom, are they familiar with technology, or do you have to, as a first step, introduce them to technology? Oh, that really varies. Some children come with quite a bit of knowledge, and some don't know a whole lot. Um, but it does provide a teacher for an extra layer to think about in terms of instruction in the classroom. I'm not going to deny the fact that in addition to teaching the principles of writing, there's also teaching the technology and the teacher um, really should feel uh, comfortable for that. And I think that that frightens some of at least my colleagues and the experience I have had that they don't want to want to confront that. But I just wanted to make a little um, reference as well to the English language learners and acquisition of language. You know that little red line that you get when you're on a word document and you just spell it right? Sometimes the spelling is so off, well that was the best motivator to get a kid to... Spell check's not going to work, it just doesn't recognize anything. They're going to go up and get a traditional SARS or dictionary and find out exactly how to spell it. So it's just a great tool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just add... Um to the, the students being on different levels. Um, I experienced that as well, and, and I think it's it's the perfect opportunity for us teachers to turn it over to other students, to say, okay, um, you know, so-and-so is an expert um, with blogging, or so-and-so is an expert with um, using iMovie, so you should go and talk with them. And I think as teachers, we're, we're reluctant to give up control, but I think we have to. So, Joel, when I was looking at your presentation, I saw very sophisticated monitors, computers in the classroom, and I was thinking to myself, well, when did that stuff come on board, who provides it, and is it in every classroom for everyone who's dealing with te teaching people how to write and how to use English properly, or is this jo just Joel's classroom? Um, I wish I had better news, um, but my classroom is unique in my building. Um, I do teach three different classes. The only class that I need that level of technology is for my mass media and film production class. Luckily, my other students benefit from that by being able to be in a class in that same setting. Um, most of the classes in my in my school um, have two or three computers or whatever, the PCs, you know, they work pretty well. We have a couple computer labs, but computer lab, it's a broken model. Um, I had to sign up for computer labs. Teachers that only use technology, and then they know they can plan on using that technology on any given day. Um, that's when they really need, that's when they're really able to build it in. So no, they're not getting that exposure to technology in a whole lot of other classes. As far as like where that equipment came from, we're still, you know, I still teach in New York State. New York State still has budget problems. Um, I teach in the third poorest urban area in the country. Luckily, we formed a partnership with the University of Buffalo, and the University of Buffalo, through an inner ring suburb grant, provided us with the things you see in my classroom. They gave us 16. Macintosh computers with 24 inch monitors, and I do have a dozen or more video cameras, most of which work pretty well, but you know, those things don't last too long. So, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I wish that it was in more classes. But most of the things that I do, other than the film editing, you could do on a netbook, you could do on a $300 piece of machine. Uh, so. And is that the case for you, Jennifer? Are you um, because of our, our status as being a, net, uh, um, a new tech school, um, that's kind of one of the requirements. So luckily in our school, all, all of the classrooms have um, netbooks that students are able to use, and it's a one-to-one. -one you're dealing with uh, troglodyte here, so you got to tell me, what's a netbook? A netbook is a, a smaller laptop. It's the inexpensive laptop. So everybody gets a netbook? The, yes, and it, they're, they, they remain at the school. Last year we were able to have students take them home, but we are, we are struggling as well, so they're in the classroom, but it is a one-to-one student-to-computer -to ratio Everybody. in every classroom. And Robert? Same, same with um, We just moved into a brand new building, coming from a hundred-year-old building to a pretty state-of-the-art classroom. So the funding was there for the technology. So we have the interactive whiteboards, smart boards, and the classroom has five same Macs, I think, that you have. Joel, you said, though, that you thought that the computer uh, 
space, the idea of everybody having time in the computer room is a broken mind. So why'd you say that? Well, um, okay, so I teach, let's say I just teach three English ten classes on any given day. If I try to sign up for a computer lab, most likely because we only have two computer labs, all those computer labs will be signed out. And maybe it'll be signed out for one period. So having that access is, is, is nearly impossible. Um, I'll use another example. I just, I mean, through this UV grant, I got a projector in my room. So I can plan on this projector, this, this, you know, this LCD projector. I can plan on that being in my classroom every single day because I can plan for that. I do plan for that, and I look for other ways to integrate it, and that opens up the walls of my classroom, and it helps me expose students to more and more things. But um, if I had to sign out that LCD projector, um, I would plan for it less, and I might take routes that were, you know, paths of least resistance. But so your argument would be every classroom should have this technology rather than having it set aside as a, and, and requiring a special efforts to sign up by the students to get access to the, to the technology. A lot of different teachers who teach a lot of different ways. Um, and there are teachers who can teach really well with a piece of chalk and a chalkboard. Um, there are other arguments to that. Way. But um, yeah, I think we need to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation. If I'm to offer every single one of my students, despite the digital divide, the same opportunities I need to be in a one-to-one -one ratio. And I'm not right now in my mass media class, I have 23 kids, 16 computers, I have to have kids double up, and what does that mean? That means on any given day, some kid's not working as efficiently as he could be. That means every, on any given day, seven kids or whatever are not immersed in the movie-making process and not immersed with the stories we're trying to tell. Can I um, just say, the, um, in our school, every teacher was issued a new MacBook uh, Pro to use the internet with their smartboards in the classroom, and that has really pushed the uh, technology of some, uh, some of my colleagues, a uh, different generation. But um, they were also offered a lot of time to be able to get training in the new technology. You mean the teachers? The teachers. And that's pretty critical, I think. It doesn't occur a great deal. There's a time given to teachers to be able to come out of the classroom to learn that technology. But let me tell you, I, my a heart went out to them. I saw this haggard look on some of their faces. They were very frightened to even open it up. And they, given that time and given that motivation, they, they are beginning to learn it. And when I walk through the halls, I'm seeing them actually on the internet whiteboard. Some teachers I never thought would even pick it up at all, the chalk. So let's, as we close out, as we close out this, this phase of, the, of, of our, our session time here together, I wanted to ask each of you a simple question. In terms of real results for the student, learning English, becoming better writers and better readers, does the technology enhance your ability to get those better results out of students today? And is this something that you could disaggregate by grade as it impacts people at certain levels more than others, or is it across the board K through 12? Robert, why don't you start? Well, I can only speak from a K-8 perspective since that's my knowledge base, and I'd say it's across the board. Uh, all my, my experience and background is in English language learners. We have Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans, and Vietnamese, and that's 80 to 90 percent of my population. As I made reference to, the confidence level shoots and skyrockets when the children have an opportunity to play with the technology, which they can pick up quickly with guidance and proper uh, instruction. And I have seen uh, incremental um, movements forward, as with that little girl, even if you heard um, I the artwork, was happening. she came at that silent stage where they say nothing, and I heard her voice, and it was just like a voice from an angel, you yes, me. Wonderful. Joe? Um, yeah, I would say absolutely. It, it, um, it has produced results across the board, no matter what class I teach. Um, I think about the things that I was doing back in, in Buffalo, where I was also in a pretty good situation. I had a number of Mac computers um, that were aging or whatever. But um, whether it be AP Literature or English 10, I see rapid growth. I mean, what does a writer need to improve? Okay. How do you improve writing? Writers need feedback. Writers need to know that there's an audience, an authentic audience. And those digital tools provides that authentic writing experience, so they're trying harder. 
they're being more focused, they're choosing the words carefully, and they're going back and revising. The other thing the visual tools do is allows me to provide feedback at the point of need. Um, I'm not looking over the shoulder in a journal. I am on another computer looking over um, their Google Doc, the same piece of writing that they're looking at. I can provide that type of feedback really well. Another thing that I do is um, I have a Google Voice number. I allow students to text me at that Google Voice number. It's just like an email pretty much. It's not like they're texting my phone. But on a weekend, if a kid is working on a paper and it's due Monday, they'll, they'll, they'll send me a Google Voice uh, text and they'll say, hey, could you look at this introduction? And I think the breakdown of walls, the breakdown of barriers, which this technology affords, allows me to give that immediate feedback that helps these kids um, help themselves break down. So the result is, you think, you get better results for the students. Absolutely. I think that their voice improves, I think their attention, their vision improves, and their writing improves. Absolutely. Jim? I would agree with um, everything that both Robert and Joel have said. Um, I would just add that I think we have to be careful that we are helping teachers to understand how to use these tools because just throwing the tools there is not going to get you anywhere. Um, you, you, can, you can have these tools and, and end up using them in the same traditional ways. I think we have to really be thinking about how can we use them authentic, authentically um, and so that it's relevant for the students and that means helping teachers to understand how they can um, integrate them in a way that's, that is useful. Okay, so now we're going to go on to uh, our next phase with questions from the audience, but we're also going to be joined here at the uh, table uh, by Sharon Washington, uh, who you've heard from before, Executive Director of the National Writing Project. All of our teachers here today, by the way, are part of the National Writing Project, which is a national professional development network dedicated to improving writing, uh, uh, teaching of writing from grades K through 12, there are over 200 writing project sites around the country, all of them anchored at university campuses to serve the surrounding schools and districts. They get funding from uh, the Department of Education, the U.S. government, as well as state and local support. So Sharon's going to join us. And also joining us is Tom Rudenfront, who's the senior VP of the college board. Tom's there on the end. Uh, and his title is, his job, or his title is supposed to be Advocacy and Government Relations here on the Hill. What he really does is he talks with members of Congress and their staffs about improving college access for young people, as well as co improving college completion rates. He has a special emphasis on uh, giving students help with technology, curriculum, uh, as well as uh, common standards, common standards for achievement. So please welcome uh, Sharon and Tom. And let me ask them as we get going on this, if you had any thoughts you wanted to contribute initially, given what we've heard from the teachers. I think the one thing that I would just add, um, and I certainly would want to echo the piece about wanting to provide professional development and the importance of providing professional development to teachers in the use of these digital tools. Um, the teachers have the time uh, and they feel like they can actually learn it and make their own mistakes without doing it in front of their students the first few times. They really are quite eager to do it. Uh, and I would also say, uh, based on a 2009 Bell Bel Rusnell study, they actually found that 8 out of 10 Americans believe that writing is more important today than it was 20 years ago. I'll be very brief. What I learned is that we have great teachers who know how to make effective use of technology, but the most important thing is they're great teachers. They're passionate, they care, they touch students in meaningful ways. That's what this is all about. Teachers are the center of education, and that's why we brought authentic teacher voices to this conversation. And I think it's, uh, they, I hope they touched your hearts in the same way they touched mine with what they've shown us today. Tom, by the way, uh, given our location here uh, in the Capitol, I wanted to ask you if you get a strong response from America's political leaders when you talk to them about increasing the presence of technology in the classroom as a tool for better teaching? Often you do if you can show and illustrate how it can be effective. You know, I defer to the staffers who are here, many of you, you get a dozen memos a day, you get people calling you, asking you things. You hear a thousand points of view a day about, for example, ESEA reauthorization. The hope here is that the conversation can get you to reflect on, okay, here's an effective use of technology to improve teaching and learning. Now, what am I going to do to 
translate what I learned today into ESEA reauthorization into public policy. And I hope you'll remember today's meeting as a way to maybe contact these teachers or contact remarkable staff at the National Writing Project to help think through how to take what was discussed today and use the policy process to make what you saw a part of every classroom in America. Okay, so now we have uh, Genevieve and Fiona with the microphones, and I'm trying to, yep, I see them, so just hold your hand up and, and identify yourself when she gives you the microphone. Uh, my name is Jim Colmus from Knowledge Alliance, and I want to congratulate you, uh, College Board and uh, the National Writing Project for a great gathering and really terrific presentations that are very inspiring. What's Knowledge Alliance? Knowledge Alliance is a trade association that promotes the use of research-based knowledge in shaping policy and practice. So I was really interested in your last question, actually, about how does this process, how does this work really affect and impact uh, student learning? And I know that there's research going on right now uh, trying to get at that, to try to really zero in on what the impact is. My question, though, is, is a little off. Uh, yesterday, I uh, accidentally left my smartphone at home. And so during the course of the day, I went through withdrawals. You know, I, I couldn't email, I couldn't text, I couldn't uh, tweet. And um, it made me think, as you, you all were talking, that maybe it was just as well as I didn't have my smartphone because it had this kind of perverse effect on, on me uh, in paying attention and uh, using long sentences to uh, make a point. And text messaging, for example, can, can really uh, corrupt uh, good writing skills. So I was wondering how you deal with those issues uh, and kind of converting them into a positive learning experience that would produce the kind of results that one needs to stop. So let me just pick on people here so we can get more because I saw so many hands go up. So Jennifer, let me just pick on you and say, I thought that was really interesting. You know, if you look at the language, even the spelling, and we heard reference to spelling and the, the advantage of getting people to spell words correctly. Uh, does it have an impact that people, in fact, use abbreviations, short sentences that wouldn't make sense if you were reading them in a book? Absolutely, yes. Yes, and I think just speaking to the distractions, I, I agree. Having the one-to-one -one computer to student ratio, last year we, um, our students discovered Skype before they discovered, before they understood how to save their Word documents um, on their computers. They were able, they figured out, we can Skype our friends who are across the hall. I can even Skype my friend who's across the room, but I can't, you know, yell out to. Um, and it has been a very difficult thing to deal with um, in how to, to get the students focused. Um, they all have their phones. They all have their MP3 players. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, my feeling is, we all have those distractions, and isn't it better that our students learn in high school how to manage and balance all of these things coming at them? And yes, there are a lot of conversations about it, um, and a lot of reminders about what, what they're supposed to be doing. But at the end of the day, when they walk out, when they graduate, they're on their own, and they have to be able to not balance those things themselves. So I feel like. It's, this is the testing ground for how are you going to balance your life because it's yeah, but going Jennifer, away. but Jennifer, if can can you say that then let's say when they show up and they say, Juan, I'd like to get a job at NPR, and I say, yeah, well, can you write? Can they write a whole sentence? I, they should be able to write a whole sentence if they're coming to you, and yes, I think that that part using these digital tools. Um, it, it, and, and blogging and um, writing in, in various formats, yes, that's something that we have to continue to work on and correct. And I think when we have the input of peers, of teachers, on a very regular and consistent basis, they can begin to understand, okay, yes, texting mode here, um, professional writing here, email writing here, uh, maybe more informal writing. But yes, they, they have to scrutinize. So you're doing, you're saying you are doing a better job of teaching them how to write properly. I think that in using these tools, that yes, that that, that is that is getting at it is understand that the students understand that there are um, many different genres that you are that you have to write in and understanding how Robert to. Robert wants to jump in. Thank you very much. I, mean, I would love to jump in because <clears throat> the principles, as far as my experience has shown, the principles of writing that remain constant don't end with digital technology. 
So any child, I hope, that I have instructed who wants to eventually become, come to you at NPR and wants a job, will still have those principles, but will additionally know how to translate those through the use of digital technology. So what you saw here were finished pieces. Who you, when you heard Elaine's voice and then Ely's voice were polished final pieces that took months to get to. So teaching a child, all right, let's step back from this piece. You're getting frustrated. You saw that picture of me. I'm getting frustrated while I was kind of turned this way and the girl's kind of this way. We are both getting frustrated. Let's put the work to rest, come back to it in a few days, and then the child's eyes open up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could have done this. Let me, let me do this again. Because the kid doesn't want to revise it. For them, it's done the first time it's done. These principles are still taught methodically and thoughtfully. They don't go away just because it's digital. Another question. I'm Carolyn Hinrich with the University of California, which houses uh, several natural writing project projects. Um, I, my question is about um, the the key message I got out of all the stories is that these children are they're clearly learning. They're clearly learning the material in a way that's not a one point in time standardized test. They demonstrate it to you as much as they might not have been able to in a standardized test because of the language learning or whatever. And um, they they seem engaged and eager and, you know, all those good things. So I think that's the key message, that technology is not, it doesn't mean a computer in every classroom anymore necessarily the way I think. I'm, I'm definitely a chalk teacher. When you talk about education technology, that used to mean we have to have a computer in every classroom. It didn't mean teachers engaging in ways to get, to get children to show what they learn through different media. So I think one of the challenges is trying to figure out how, you know, how to make that transition. And I don't know if it's been considered or not, but some sort of technology project where that uses the same principles as the writing project where teachers be brought in to learn these things and then go back and teach other teachers, you know, using the same model. Well, let me ask Sharon. Uh, Sharon, what do you see nationally are, I guess it's sort of a derogatory term in this session, chalk teachers. Uh, <laughs> are chalk teachers getting help to make the transition to using technology? Absolutely. And can I just add one other aspect of that? Because but now, you would never question putting in a desk in every classroom. A desk was an essential tool. To me, it seems like computers are an essential tool that aren't an add-on that, you know, as we used to talk about it, we just have to get, you know, the teachers, all teachers, not just the young ones. Okay. Absolutely. And I would say that um, we are doing, within the National Writing Project, we have networks within the network. And we're actually having a focus on digital writing, digital media. Um, we're the recipients of the MacArthur Award for the second year, and we have a project called Digital Is. It's not digital in the future, it's not digital, you know, tomorrow, it's digital is because it's everywhere. It's in our tech our mobile technologies, it's in our classrooms, it's on the web. And so we've got teachers engaged all over the country through the National Writing Project, really looking at not only just how to use the classroom technologies that are out there today, but also looking at how does it impact the way that students are learning. And so we're really looking at that in the National Writing Project. And so people can come to us to learn those tools too. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm, um, my name is Leslie Gatch, I'm with the Maryland Writing Project. And I um, come from a little different background in that I taught at a college prep school, a laptop college prep school for many years, and I also teach freshman well, developmental writing in several colleges. And it seems to me there's a disconnect between college prep expectations and teaching writing digitally as you're talking about, um, and also having two kids just finish college. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, most of their writing was conventional essay type writing and I, my developmental writing courses for different colleges around the area, they, that's what they're interested in. So it concerns me that you're 
you know, my concerns me, but I, I'm interested in knowing, are, are you really putting uh, kids at a disadvantage when you don't uh, also uh, teach them sort of traditional ways of writing? I think that comes back to the earlier question. So let me just, I, Joel, you didn't answer on that one. Why don't you try it? Um, I don't know. It's like um, I'm not abandoning traditional writing. Um, my students hand in these digital projects. They'll also hand in their voiceover as a paper. And what's that voiceover? It's either a personal essay or um, in, in terms of the, uh, the documentary project, it's a... It's an MLA cited research paper. Uh, I like to think to be taken a little bit further um, by taking these compositions, these traditional compositions, and pushing them forward into um, a good type of writing, into a type of writing that actually has an audience and a type of writing that will have legs. Um, so I think we, we go further than the traditional writing. Now, do we spend, do we produce less pieces over the course of the year? Yes, we do produce less pieces. Um, because it takes three to four weeks, sometimes five weeks, to produce one of these projects. It takes a lot of time. It's very intensive. Um, but I like right, to think right. that... So, in terms of actual pieces of writing that are produced in the course of the class, you're saying there's less writing or there's more writing? And there's definitely more writing. My students write, I think, like, uh, their blogs, uh, like 500 words a week for that, and then over the course of... Over the course of on the project, they write the piece that will serve as a final paper type thing, whether it be a personal essay or a research project, and they'll also write some reflective, some more formal reflective pieces for us. So more of it, I think. So Leslie's point is, are you preparing these young people to do the kinds of essays, the standard work that a college would require? Do you think you are? I think I am. Another question? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just wanted to add that I, I, I would just say that it is an addition to I, 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 I'm still doing research papers in my classroom. Uh, we still are, are tacking the, 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 the essays they're going to face on standardized tests, um, but we're trying to move out further and, and get into some of the writing that is in the real world and in blogging and in, uh, allowing them to find voice in their digital stories. Do you have another question? Can I add just one thing there? No. Yes, of course. <laughs> I was a university faculty member for 11 years before becoming an administrator, and one of the things that I noted was that young people coming through K-12, by the time that they got to the university, is that very often new things would come in at the sort of the elementary, secondary level, and very many college professors, you know, I know I don't look that way, but we're old, and many of us don't start teaching in, at the university when we're in our early 20s or mid-20s. And so I think it's going to take more time for some of these changes to really make an impact on higher education. But one of the things that I clearly know is that universities are taking digital stories for students' admissions letters. I mean, they're not just coming as the letters that we all wrote to get into college 20, 30 years ago. But the SAT, you know, still has a standard essay on it. So I'm, that's my point, is that maybe college is needed to, needs to be more And I would agree. And, you know, thank goodness, you know, College Board is here. It does have something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just going to our teacher, you know, that, that's one thing you want a good grade and all of that, but when we knew that it was going to be peer edited and reviewed by other students in the classroom, I almost feel like I tried harder. And so it seems, because, you know, you want to impress your fellow students. And so you were speaking, talking about how all of these things that you post the blogs and whatnot, students are able to comment on each other's. And so do you feel that has a good impact? How much feedback do they give to each other? And maybe how does that affect them? Anybody want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> Just at the elementary level, I did use blogs for the first time with this project. And um, it, 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 that's another principle of, of the teaching and writing, and that's editing and peer editing before it goes to your teachers. Blogs were a wonderful way for that, for that to happen. Joe? 
Yeah, it actually gives me another thing to teach in the classroom as well because um, the students get a lot of feedback from each other. A lot of times it's very superficial comments, either comments like, great point, things like that. So teaching them to respond in a way that's, that's with more depth is also another lesson that I kind of build into what we're talking about. And if you look at society today, it was one of the reasons, you know, one problem is that people respond superficially and, you know, a lot of talking heads. So I think that that's another critical thinking component when you get kids writing for an audience that they care about. And I may be funny, I may have a big smile, but they often don't care what I think, but they do care what their peers think, like you said, um, that they do, they do value that they do try harder. But it could be chilling and intimidating if you get some sort of scathing comment or criticism from your fellow students. So could that be an impediment then to doing the work? I, I think, in my experience, um, it, it is pretty rare that students are scathing with each other. I think it, it's more common that it is more superficial. And so getting them to delve a little deeper and ask good questions of each other um, is, is a lesson that's there. Okay, another question? Hi, I'm Jennifer Castagna with the Senate LHHS Subcommittee, the Brown Student Studies Education for the Minority. And I was recently in Mississippi, and we visited the Oxford um, National Writing Project and visited teachers. Very impressed. It's a very affluent community, and that was very visible from the buy in from the principals and teachers, and they allowed the teachers to be at the schools to come visit with us. Um, I guess one of the recommendations in the report that I'm kind of thinking of more of a long-term goal is a one-to-one -one access for computer technology. Because I think in Oxford, they're well on their way, but down in Mississippi Delta, it's a different story. So I guess if you could speak to that, where if that's more of a long-term goal, what can we do in the short term to kind of start to move in that direction? And what we can do on the federal level, since I do work for the corporation company, to kind of get everyone there. Tom, I think this is up your alley. <laughs> yeah, to me that's actually an easy one. I think as Congress looks at ESEA reauthorization, if you make technology, the effective use of technology in the classroom a priority, you'll look for opportunities to incentivize states and districts through grants or other programs to put the technology into the classroom. I know in certain districts and states there are partnerships between the technology companies, government, and schools. You could encourage that kind of thing through ESEA. So, I urge you, I mean, it's great you're thinking about this, and again, I urge you to talk to folks at the National Writing Project, the teachers here, folks at the college board. How can we help support that agenda of increased use of effective technology in the classroom and more money, government money and private money, to support that, that goal? Tom, what about the, the gap? I think it was Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer described between communities, you know, you come from a more affluent community, there's going to be more computers, poor communities don't have it. Is that a point of leverage in the conversation with politicians about making, about putting more computers into the classroom? I think it's a great point of leverage, and I also think, you uh, heard from teachers today who come from communities that are not wealthy, and they've made effective use of technology, sometimes piecing together different resources sometimes probably spending weekends on their own repairing it themselves. That's unfortunate. But again, I go back to the initial point. You get a great, passionate teacher, and you, pro you provide them with the access to resources, even limited resources, and they can work the kind of magic you saw today. And uh, again, I ask our, our staffers here to think about creative ways to use the policy process to get these technologies into the right hands. OK, we have time for, I think, two more questions. Good morning. I'm Barbara Cambridge from the National Council of Teachers of English. And thank you so much, teachers, for being here. I want to stay on the ESEA topic, Tom, that you've um, introduced. Um, and I do think that putting the right resources, digital resources, in the hands of teachers is important. But I listened to Robert and, and Jennifer uh, indirectly talk about the importance of time. That is, time to be able to develop knowledge of the resources, to work with students, to learn from students, in fact. There is a bill right now uh, that's been introduced both in the House and the Senate called the Learn Bill. And in the Learn Bill, writing is as significant as reading, a real step forward uh, in terms of federal policy. There's also provision in there for professional development. And the, one of the descriptors of that is job embedded. That is, that includes uh, being done during the school day. Robert, I wanted to ask you and, and others as well, where do you get the time? Who needs to be 
in on um, supporting that time, in addition to having um, a federal policy that recognizes and supports it? I don't know. I don't know who makes these schedules up. <laughs> I really don't know. It, it's, it's silly to me that um, there are so few professional development days, and those professional development days are so scripted by the school district. I, I mean, I am loyal to my employer, and I'm going to continue working for them, but um, everything is, is so data-driven now, and analyzing these numbers and looking at this dry information, how does that drive your instruction? There seems very little time for teachers to collaborate, to think, and to pull all of these different knowledges together into some cohesive classroom experience. And um, that's, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think you can feel my frustration. It's like, um, it's like trying to provide professional development during a show that's always live. We can't let our students watch themselves, we always have something to do. And um, I'm not, I'm very biased towards this, but that's why I, I think that the writing project model works very well, and this other organization that was involved with City Voice and City Visions works very well. It's not one and off. You know, you don't go to one day of professional development and leave. It's an immersive experience to become a, or Western New York, I'm sorry, become a writing project teaching consultant. You spend a month at an institute. You meet every day. You read, you write, you talk about educational ideas. And that immersive experience is what produces long-term results. The City Voices, where I learned how to teach kids how to do digital videos, same exact thing. Two weeks during the summer, every day we came, we made videos. And the other piece of that is I was able to remain connected to these organizations um, through various means. Uh, City Voices has yearly reunions where teachers come and they share their films, their student films. They also share uh, different things that they've learned during the year. And the same model works within our Western New York Writing Project through the National Writing Project. We get together, we talk about ideas, and a consistent support is what really makes a difference in my opinion. Okay, our last question for the morning. Hi, I'm Jordan. I work for uh, Representative Doggett on the House side. Um, we are seeing here a lot of uh, emphasis on technology and, and computers, and you know, President Obama recently came out and said that we need to spend know, a month longer in the classroom, but we're also facing these sorts of problems of funding and of budgets. So I guess my question to, to open up to you is, how do we deal with the necessary, you know, the need for more resources at a time when budgets are constrained? How do we do more with the money that we already have without, you know, continuing to put more money into things that maybe aren't working so well? Yeah. Well. One piece of good news is, I mean, times are very tough. And there's no easy answer, but the new infusion of funds in the recent, in the last 18 months to the ARRA, the $100 billion, including the $3.5 billion for school improvement grants, for example. The district and the state have a couple options. They can just take that money and use it for more of the same, and oftentimes they need to do that. They have no choice. But they can also look for creative uses of these funds. I think some of the I-3 grants the use of technology in an effective way. The SIG grants for low-performing schools and turning them around. We need to encourage administrators to take the existing resources, use them where they need to to rehire teachers that would otherwise be laid off, but also dedicate a portion of those funds for creative and more effective use of technology, teacher professional development, and other things that, I mean, I mean times are tough. There's no easy answer. And Budgets are constrained across the board. So we need to be smarter about dedicating a portion of those funds to the kinds of things we saw here today. And I would just add to that, that knowing that times really are, they're tough. I mean, and so it's really about trying to find good investments and trying to find those programs that really do uh, leverage the federal dollars and don't just sort of see it as a, you know, bank or an ATM, but really about taking the dollars and then trying to leverage them for other dollars. And one of the things about the writing project is that we take every federal dollar and match it dollar to dollar. So it's an incredible investment. And it's also into an infrastructure that in and of itself keeps generating and disseminating information broadly across the nation. So it's really, and for those programs that also have proven effectiveness, they've got research that actually shows their impact that they have on student achievement. And so I think 
making those kind of selective decisions. And the National Rhyme Project isn't alone in that. I mean, there are other organizations that are also doing very similar types of things with the investment from the Congress. I said that was the last question, but I saw that you had your hand up, so I yeah, wanted to make sure that you got your question answered. Just quickly, I'm Alex Nabin, I'm a senator Conrad's office, and I had a question on behalf of my girlfriend, actually, who's a special ed elementary special education major, um, and going to be a special education teacher, and she was wondering, she has a lot of students, and maybe this is best for you, Robert, um, in elementary ed and special ed, who um, they kind of become overwhelmed, and one of the good things about digital media is there are a lot of different uh, tools that are brought into the process, but with special edu education students, um, it just kind of becomes too much for them, and they kind of get distracted by it. Is there anything you found that's been a simple approach that has actually kind of honed the interests of the students instead of kind of taking away um, their attention and focus on it? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I guess I could talk to you personally about more specific technology that are out there, like the universal access that you have on Mac machines and stuff that can talk to you. But I think the, the bigger thing here is, or the bigger issue, is sort of what um, Jennifer had referred to earlier, and that's a balance in life. And I'm very, very clear about that in my classroom. There is a time for the digital technologies and this cool kind of the seduction. I like to call it the seduction of the technology. And there's a time to be in a circle, as you saw in my video, where you're talking to each other and you're building those human relationships that are still just as important in the classroom setting as the digital technology. So that would be my general answer to you at this point. I actually have a nephew who has dyslexia, and he ended up going to uh, an out-of-district placement to deal with his learning dis differences. And one of the things that I saw in the school that he then got placed into was a huge difference in his confidence particularly when it came to writing, which was truly reading and writing were places where he struggled. And by using um, the Dictate, by using different Mac sort of pieces of software, he was actually able to t spend more time writing and then later going back and figuring out, okay, what's wrong with this sentence? What's wrong with this paper? Um, and for him, he saw the red, the red line, you know, as an indication that it's not spelled right, so he didn't get, feel like he could get close enough. And then, the software itself would help it. And for that, it gave him confidence. And I'm, you know, I couldn't be more proud on for the fact that this school brought digital technologies into the classroom, and he's a freshman in college right now, so. So we've come to the end, and I wanted to ask Tom for some final thoughts to close us out. And I'll do that from here. I'll be very brief, because I know we're over time. But um, if you think about when we first started, some of us first started this policy process of looking at ways to improve education many years ago. One of the things people would say is, well, we have all these classroom buildings, but they sit empty about 18 hours a day. We need better use of time and we need better use of resources to engage our students. Well, we've just seen today that there are ways to engage students 24 hours a day or have them engage with each other through the creative use. And if you look at the title, the subtitle of this report, Writing, learning, and leading in the digital age. I think you saw examples of writing and learning, but especially leading and thinking about how we can keep kids engaged and motivated with themselves, with their teachers, 24 hours a day. This is the beginning, I think, of a process. Higher education is way behind on a lot of this stuff. And we have a lot to learn in higher ed from our, our friends in K-12. So. Um, we're just scratching the surface of what lies ahead if we, if we have the kind of leaders we have in the room today and the kind of teachers we have on the panel. So please join me in thanking our moderator, Juan Williams, and our great teachers who were on the panel. And a, a warm thanks from the College Board to our partners in this project, the National Writing Project, a great team of educators, scholars, and passionate people themselves. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay in touch and please engage the National Writing Project team as you work through these tough policy choices here in, in Washington and even at the state level. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Another great question.